And we thought Unity was doing well, so it was like way bothering. So we just open sourced it and put it in GitHub. So we went through the whole backlog, we sorted everything, and then I started also reviewing pull requests. So this, this looks cool, there is an editor, it's very interesting, and I kind of uh, got into it. And then at a certain point, my friend comes and says, oh, my friend has found this random engine. <laughs> And so, since it's open source, I decided I could check the code and then I found a fix, send pull requests. And... One day I got contacted by Juan and he said if I wanted to work there and that's, that's how it started. So far it's been uh, pretty good because uh, I actually enjoy doing my, uh, my work a lot. And so I went on GitHub and searched for Game Engine and then it up on Godot. <laughs> This past June, I went to the Godot Sprint and User Meeting in Barcelona. I met a lot of familiar faces and was lucky to get to interview some of the people behind the engine. I asked Juan, the co-founder of Godot, how he got started with programming. My parents were sending me to study computing, which at the time was like logo programming. Uh, so I started learning logo when I was like eight. I kind of learned to make games with it and moved to basic and then uh, I got a Commodore 64 and I had like, I was using basic but it was very slow so I asked like an uncle I have and he gave me a, an assembler book for the Commodore 64. I started doing like more completed games uh, in when I was 16, like 95, just using mostly Pascal and assembly. Uh, I finished a game that I put some videos on my YouTube channel called Nuku. It was a squirrel, kind of like Mario, but squirrel. And, uh, and then when I finished high school, I went to university, started to do this more professionally. So I started getting like to with other people very young, like finishing high school and dreaming of having a game industry in Argentina. Juan is one of the most prominent faces of the Godot engine. If you search him online, you will find many talks and interviews. But before the engine got public and many people started contributing to it, the other half of the project was Ariel. A Juan lo conocí en el 96, por ahí. Antes de internet, había unos sistemas que se llamaban BBS, Bulletin Board System, que te conectabas con un modem, y había un chat, era como una mini internet. Había un chat, había, podías jugar, bajar archivos, jugar juegos y ahí chateando, eh, y él programaba juegos en Pascal. Y después, por el 2001, Juan estaba con un grupo de gente eh, haciendo un juego, un, un MMO RPG, es lo clásico que hacen con lo que empiezan todos. Demasiado grande, y, pero todos estábamos como si sí, íbamos a hacer esto. Si you try to pinpoint the exact moment the Godot engine was created, you will soon notice that there isn't an exact date. The engine is something that they both develop in their journey, constantly changing and adapting to the projects they were working on. The first thing I did professionally was founding NGD Studios, which is a company that still exists today. It's called Nimble Giant, with, with some other people who wanted to make games. And we worked on an MMO, which was called, in the end, Champions of Regnum. Uh, I only wore like for a bit more than a year doing like the engine, the core engine. Then I left to do other stuff but they continued and they published the game. Then I worked for many, many companies doing consulting and technical consulting. And eventually I was like, okay, I want to have my own company. So I joined uh, Martina and other guys from Ocam Studio. And we made, Ocam Studio was not really for making games, but we made it a game company. Working with them like was really, really good synergy. Like they were very creative and I was very technical. So in very few years we got from not getting any clients uh, to getting to work for like Square Enix, uh, Turner, uh, Koch Media. We published like many games. Uh, we published a game of the football franchise. We published uh, Ultimo Carnaval for Square Enix. We published uh, Doc Mendoza, which was an adventure game. It's on Steam. All, all made with Godot, of course. So eventually, because the country is very, very, very unstable, uh, I decided to like close uh, well, with my other partners, like close the company and just started doing consulting, mostly business consulting because I got a lot of experience doing business. And I was just working on the engine that I open source with Ariel in 2014 because uh, we didn't plan on selling it. It was pretty good, but turning it into a product was like too much and we didn't want to. And we thought Unity was doing well, so it was like way bothering. So we just open sourced it and put it in GitHub. 
desde el principio en mente hacer, hacerlo abierto. Al principio era dual license, GPL y una licencia comercial por QT. Porque QT es así, nos gustaba QT. Pero después de un tiempo estábamos usando Godot. Empezamos a usar Godot para trabajar. Y como teníamos trabajo haciendo juegos, no había nada eh, que se pueda usar realmente en producción, digamos. La motivación no es el negocio. Bueno, se hace MIT y eso es mucho más fácil para todos. But since people were using it and I was doing other stuff, that wasn't taking that much time. I started working on it as a hobby, like taking issues and fixing them, like reviewing pull requests and getting more people to contribute. But eventually it did, it did grow very fast. Like a couple of years later, in 2018, it was already being used by a lot of people. And it, it grew exponentially from there. But what do you do when your project suddenly becomes popular? While they were working on the programming side of things, they needed some help with managing the beast that Godot was turning into. That's when Remy comes in. Remy is a crucial part of what Godot is now, but at the time he was working on another open source project, a Linux distribution called Majaya. I asked him about his introduction to open source. I actually did a bit of everything. Uh, since when I started, I had no real technical skills, so I was uh, working on the French translation. And then since I had free time uh, and I was ready to take responsibilities, I worked, I became like the team leader for French translation and then the team leader for all the internationalization teams. And then I started also working on documentation, on bug tracing, um, on QA. And then eventually I learned uh, software packaging and a bit of development. I led the packaging team, so I did a bit of everything. Uh, but then, yeah, gradually I got into the more technical things. And that's as a packager that I came to Godot and I was like, ah, that looks cool. I already package open source games. Maybe I can package these so that people can make games uh, on Majaya. And then I saw in Godot that there was a lot of potential, but I could see what was missing in terms of handling the project uh, so that it succeeds better. There was a huge backlog at the time, huge. It's much less than now, <laughs> but the project was much smaller. There was a lot of um, open issues which had actually been fixed and nobody had bothered closing them. There was a lot of pull requests which were not being reviewed. Like a lot at the time was like 100. Now we have 1,500, but they are being reviewed. It's just the volume became massive. Yeah. But Juan was the only one in charge and he was like, he's working really single threaded. So he was working on stuff and then once per month he was checking some pull requests and then saying like, yes, no, yes, no, basically. So I, I poked and poked and said like, we need to organize this better. And then eventually he gave me uh, permissions to like organize the issue triage with a team of contributors, uh, many of which are still active now. And I was there and I thought, okay, don't you want to join also the, the GitHub organization have helped me with bug triaging, which was um, was did mostly at the time. And I was very interested in doing something with uh, GDScript. So I asked Juan if I could do optional typing for GDScript. And he says, okay, go ahead. And so around that time I was looking, oh, maybe I can contribute to something. And I found that it was 2015. So Godot just came out in that uh, moment. Uh, if I, this, this looks cool, there is an editor is very interesting and I kind of uh, got into it on that like my first PR was a small fix uh, for gravity uh, in the God of physics. I downloaded it and then I I liked it so but there were like some small things you know that weren't that great so I started like maybe I should have a look to the code and it was quite simple so I did some improvement I started doing uh, game development in university. And then at a certain point, my friend comes and says, oh, my friend has found this random engine. <laughs> and so I feel like it's a bit like cheating for me because I actually have a lot of programming uh, background. So, you know, when something doesn't work, I go like, all right, I'm gonna fix it. <laughs> I was uh, 17 at the time. This is uh, also where I started uh, eventually doing contribution to Godot. At first I was just doing small things like maybe changing a default setting or maybe fixing a small bug, but then I started becoming more confident in my um, abilities and uh, started implementing uh, features that people uh, eventually uh, uh, appreciated a lot. Well, I started using a lot while I was on university, so I was just studying and I got into video games and then I started using a lot and I liked it. I fixed one issue, it was good, I fixed two issues and then 
it, the ball rolled. You want to do your best because everybody's seeing your code. Like if you work on a company and you can hack something together and it works and then you just forget it. But here there's a record and everybody can see it. What we try to do is do it a bit different than you would do if you're a company, uh, because God has a lot of contributors doing things. We don't really have the classical structure where you really like put KPIs and measure performance or it's more organic. We have people, we, we cannot micromanage them, so we expect them to be self-driven and to like take the lead in their areas. If we see that there are contributors doing something really well and they are doing it in their free time, uh, but they have proven that the way they do it is great, it's very easy to merge, uh, it's something that is done like the way we would expect it to be done. Uh, then we try to use the donations to hire that person to continue working and do that like for, for, for a job, you know? That's, that's how we, we think. And that so far works really well. Like uh, this has made Godot improve lots the past year. Uh, the downside to that is that maybe you it would be nice to get some parts of the engine worked, but not, nobody's doing work there. So even if you have the money, there's not much you can do. I mean, like many people in the community say, why don't you do like bounties? Uh, you put a bounty to make a feature, then uh, you, you select the person that you think that's going to like make it, and then uh, you pay that person. But in reality, it doesn't work like that. The problem is that if you have, if you have somebody that you pay to work, uh, that person may need help uh, because if you want them to do things the way you believe are, are the best for the project, like, I don't know, writing the code in a certain way, doing it efficiently, using everything properly, like, you need to spend a lot of time helping the people do what they need to do instead of, like, you working on what you have to do. As you can hear, this is a very different operation to what you might expect from a project of this size. There are other open source projects that are dealing with the challenges that Godot is, but I don't think there are many at this scale yet. So there's still a lot to explore. The interesting thing about Godot is that I don't really have like a super clear vision about it. Uh, to me, it's more understanding what others want and seeing how we can be smart enough to put it in there. We take our time, but we try to make it really good. Uh, but uh, it's always trying to follow what community needs, so we focus the most on what has the most demand. Uh, on, or just people coming and saying, I just did take it and that's great. Uh, I'm really looking forward to Godot 4 being released because it's, it's quite stressful to like always be in the rush of development or something so unstable while also working on the 3.x branch. The most exciting thing for me working on Godot is that I am a tool maker and it's amazing to see everything that the community is making with it. So I really feel like someone making pencils for painters and then I see the amazing paintings that they are creating, which are way beyond anything that I could do uh, from a creative perspective. But I know that they could also not do it without the work that I and the team are doing to enable them. Uh, so it's really, really nice feeling to, to participate in that. The anticipated version 4 of Godot is going to be releasing soon and the team keeps working very hard to make it a reality. So while my initial goal was to make a small documentary on the story of the engine, I think this project has still a lot ahead.